everybody. You're watching the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah! <laughs> Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. I am going to forego uh, an intro for this because our guest has uh, a hard out, as they say, you know, and you know, when you talk to people who work for the New York Times, you realize, oh my gosh, we're talking about people who have deadlines and major careers uh, at, at, at what many consider to be one of the number one uh, news sources uh, in the world. Of course, they have high paced lives uh, where they are going from one place to another very, very quickly. Our guest today, uh, of course, uh, well, no, wait, no, he's got to pick up his kids from school, but that's okay. Uh, we've got a heart out here, uh, but I am super, super excited for our guest today. Now, there have been a few uh, books that have been written about David Letterman and company over the years. Of course, we've got Bill Carter's book, Scott Ryan's book. We talk about that uh, on this show quite a bit, good friend of the show. Um, now, just shortly after Dave retired, uh, a book came out. Uh, called uh, David Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night. And and um, I got to tell you, um, when I started reading this book, I was completely jealous of the author. I'm going to be full disclosure, especially because of the way he started the book. He started the book by talking about uh, an initial meeting with Dave himself and, <laughs> and how he had a souvenir. And uh, y'all know who, who, who've watched this show so far, the dozens of you who have started watching this show know that uh, I love collecting Letterman merchandise. And he started the book with an anecdote about um, a collectible that he had or thought that he had. And, and I just, upon reading that anecdote, I was sucked right in uh, to this beautiful world that Jason Zinneman uh, built for all of us and, and, and did such a good job um, articulating the history and many of the stories behind the stories of David Letterman and company. Uh, I, when we first started this show, uh, uh, you know, on a prayer and a dream, uh, he was one of the first people I reached out to. Timing wasn't exactly right, but he has taken time out of his uh, extremely busy uh, New York Times infused lifestyle, being the comedy critic for the New York Times uh, author and uh, I think podcast host as well. Jason Zinneman, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here on the Letterman podcast. I cannot tell you how big of a thrill it is for me to talk to you. I'm I'm honored to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Uh, and uh, my only quibble is how come Letterman is not, my book is not behind your shoulder. You have the last days of uh, Letterman. You have all the other ones. Where? <laughs> it's like you're a prophet. It's like you're a prophet because uh, the only books that are behind me right now are signed books. And uh, so we haven't made that happen yet. But before the end of this interview, I promise um, the negotiation for uh, for that will have taken place. It's like you're a podcast prophet. Speaking of which, you start. Did you start a podcast uh, fairly recently? I did. I did. I. 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 I I, I decided I, I, at one point in my life, I said, I'm never starting a podcast, but as you know, the lure is impossible to resist. So, yep. uh, I, I have a podcast that I host with, uh, two other people, um, Parl Segal and Dan Coyce about the work of Martin Amos, the novels of Martin Amos. It's called the Martin Chronicles. So this is my first time ever plugging my podcast. Uh, so you know, that's what I am. I'm, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a podcaster. That's what I am plugging my podcast. That's fantastic. Um, I know your pain uh, and I understand the struggle. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's so funny, you know, being at a, at a party or something and, and also oh, what are you doing these days? And I have a, I have a financial firm. That's my background. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how I'm able to afford all of this. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, but then obviously you understand it as well. The podcast thing, it permeates every part of your being and the enthusiasm that it generates. So when you're at the party, you know, somebody asking you about, you know, how's work going? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's going good, good. You know, but all oh, this podcast that I have and just watching the look on their face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> somebody talks about their podcast. You know what I'm talking about, right? I do know what you're talking about, but I think this is a great idea for a podcast. I mean, the, uh, I feel like if I was a, um, if I had something like this when I was young, uh, 
uh, and I was like, let it, I would be, you know, insane, insanely thrilled and wouldn't miss an episode. Um, and, uh, I mean, let the great thing about Letterman as a subject for a podcast, probably better than my, no, almost certainly better than my <laughs> podcast, um, is that he inspires so much, uh, obsession. Yep. Um, and there's, he's also, his legacy is so complex and there it's, you know, it can't be summed up by one person or one decade or one point of view, including his, by the way, yep. um, that uh, it, it's it's a big it's big enough, bigger than bigger than a book. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's big enough that it justifies a podcast like this. So bravo. It's a great idea. I appreciate that very much. Um, and, and it happened kind of by mistake. Uh, uh, Rick Sheckman, by the way, shout out to Rick Sheckman and from Rick Sheckman. When I told him that today uh, I, I was going to have a conversation with you, his uh, response and Shecky is a man of, of, of little words sometimes. Uh, uh, oh, Zinneman. Great. He's one of the good ones. That was Shecky's, uh, uh, you know, praise of you. Um, yeah, it was funny. I've been on a radio show uh, panel uh, for the last year and a half with Alex Bennett, legendary uh, radio guy, Alex Bennett, and Checky, of course, good friends with him. And and there was a night where uh, we were on the show and Checky said, oh yeah, I got to go. Uh, I'm going on this Letterman podcast thing. And my heart kind of sank because I'm a podcast fan. But at the same time, there was always this secret desire to say, Oh, I, I wish I, I wish I hosted a letterman podcast, just kind of like what you alluded to. It just, and, and when Checky kind of said, Oh, I got to go, I got to go be on this letterman podcast thing. I was like, Oh, okay. It was like, Oh, the dream is officially dead. The heart is broken. And that's it. And then a couple hours later, he got back to me and he said, actually, uh, I was on Malkov's podcast. I was on the Carson podcast as a guest. Uh. And, and that was kind of one of the things that prodded me to go, okay, stupid. If you're going to, like you know how this feels now being on the other side of recognizing the fact that this show exists uh which i would probably listen to faithfully multiple times because i love the subject matter so much you're right um the the enthusiasm that letterman and company generated uh is one where people go deep down the rabbit hole it goes down obsession and and so that was kind of one of the things that started it but that leads to my question why do you think it is and you started as a fan i mean you start the book by talking about the enthusiasm you have you were there uh you know as a as a um, as somebody who watched the show in the crazy times when the Ed Sullivan Theater era began, you were there. You you actually got to be part of that excitement. What is it do you think about Letterman and Company specifically, as opposed to respectfully, you know, Leno and Company or 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 uh, Carson and Company, things like that? What do you think it is about Letterman that inspires that kind of deep enthusiasm? Well, it's a great question, uh, and. Um... I mean, I think there's many reasons. Uh, I think one is the the the, the time is key. Um, I mean, it is really important, and I you know I cover the the comedy scene now, yep. and we don't make figures. Pop culture doesn't make figures like David Letterman anymore, and that's not only because David Letterman is a singular figure. It's yep. also just because you know back then at twelve thirty at night. If you were interested in irreverent comedy, you only had, you know, one choice, uh, really. I mean, there was no internet. I mean, you, maybe you had a you had a a zine you were looking at, or maybe you could, <laughs> yeah, you, you had some old, uh, you know, issues of the New Yorker you're reading or something. But but uh, on television, there were very few options. So that meant that this whole group of people who were interested in 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 weird comedy. We're all watching the same thing. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, although a lot of people taped the, it, obviously, there was a sense that it was kind of ephemeral. Um, 100%. You, and that is really exciting, too, that you, you were there. Like, it's it's live. You're, 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 uh, you had to stay up. It was hard to stay up. Yep. You had to work at it. And then, and then I think, you know, certainly in the, you know, my relationship to Letterman Starter, you know, in the 80, early 80s, I would say. Yep. And often it was confusing. Often you didn't get what was going on. Like, and I, you know, one thing I believe about, um, you know, this is true about art writ large, that when art is, I think we've gotten to a place where um, the culture wants art to be easy. 
right? They want yes. it to make it easy to find, both in terms of just streaming right away, but yeah. also aesthetically easy. You want it as soon as you watch it, you want to read the explainer on Vulture and tell you what happened. You yeah. want all the themes to be easily decoded. You want the characters to be coherent, right? And um, I think this this older idea. You know, which which is you know not not endless, but you know if you look at like the modernists and stuff, there was a if anything a prejudice to the opposite that that difficulty meant it was somehow uh, more artistically worthy, right? Now I don't yes. think that is necessarily true either, but there um, I think it's important to to recognize that like you had to. I remember as a kid being like, I don't really get all these jokes, and so I'm gonna, but I knew I liked it. Yes. <laughs> and and I'm going to try to figure it out. And the fact is, if you kept watching it, you started to figure it out. Like there there was both in terms of some of the jokes were actually like call back to earlier shows, but also there was a sensibility that you kind of started to started to understand. And that's exciting when you when you have to make um, the fan kind of work at something and then they draw you in and um and so that I mean th those are all major those are all forces. I mean then there's also just like you know the, it, there was all sorts of ingenious brilliant comedy and 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 Letterman um I think it also depends on you know what age you you you, you came to him. I don't think Definitely. Letterman I think people who came to Letterman and some people might disagree with me on this but who came to Letterman in the 80s and in the 90s with the late night war are more obsessive about him than people who came to him you know, in the 2010, you know, the, yep. so it, 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 which has something to do with the work, but also has something to do with how old you are. Um, but I, I also think that he was on, and I, I'll stop going on because obviously I wrote a whole book to answer this question, but that yeah. I think he was on the forefront of a lot of things. Um, I think he, um, um, the reason people are obsessive is because he, it's important. You know, this is to understand comedy to understand popular culture to understand uh the 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 evolving role of irony in culture yep. you need to understand um david letterman yes i oh man there's a lot that you said there that i think is just it rings so true to me um the idea of the next day because i was the same way like i was the kid in elementary school who got introduced to it by uh, you know, you know, older siblings and things like that. And, 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 and it would sneak up to watch it. And it was when you bonded with somebody the next day, see, that's the thing I think about wanting to be there for that moment. It was going to school or college or wherever it was the next day and talking about the moment with people. Um, and, and again, only a select few, because it was like, like you said, you didn't get all the jokes necessarily, but I think there was an element where you also felt like you were part of something. You were part of a club, and if you got it, you were on the cool side of things um, because it was just it was just cool. The other uh, thing that I have um, compared it to is indie rock or indie bands. Like sometimes when you get a band that's really hot on the indie level and then it blows up, there are some people and you talk about, you know, times and places. There are some people who I've talked to who have reached out to us since we've started this show who are like, they draw a line in the sand. They are like, you know, once 1990 hit, basically, that's when Letterman either changed or went downhill or whatever. They are like diehard experimental, diehard the early age. And and I, I love how in your book, by the way, you talk about the different phases and evolutions because late night itself, before the late night wars were even, there was a whiff of them, really did evolve in that time. But that evolution has never stopped all the way up to my next, next guest today, all the way up to the fact that we're waiting for a U2 special with Dave to come out. Um, I, I think you put that perfectly. I cannot endorse this book enough, by the way, everybody. Anybody who listens to this or watches this, uh, get Jason's book. It's really good, and it will remind you of things that you have forgotten, I promise you, and give uh, a broader depth to that. Um, I got to ask you this, Jason, because you did come into. Oh, we got Don Giller here. There it is, right there. Don Giller showing it off. The 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 seek my secret weapon in in writing this book, Don Giller. I've I've 
I, I I've said it before. I'll say it again. I couldn't write this book without Don Giller. He's he's of course, which is true of er, almost everybody, including you, who who yeah. does something on Letterman. But uh, anyways, the uh, this uh, we've got some data in from uh, from from the data miners. Uh, apparently, our show has gotten forty eight percent better since Don Giller has uh, been a been more of a part of it. So we're we're very grateful for that. Um, the Dawn Effect, uh, you know, the book itself, I highly recommend it, like I say. Um, now, that being said, I think back to another New York Times employee who wrote a couple of books about um, everything to do with late night. And, and the late night war specifically, of course, uh, late shift one and late shift two, uh, the first is the, the first one in the early 90s, the second one in 2010-ish. Mm -hmm. um, I think about Bill Carter. He worked for the New York Times, but not in the place that you are at. I'm fascinated for the fact that that the New York Times now has a comedy critic. That's another job vicariously. I wish I could I could I could live through you doing that job. What a great job to have. He was a TV critic at the time. Uh, did you read Bill Carter's books growing up? And did you have any contact with him? I guess you guys would have been ships passing in the night at the Times. Yeah. Well, no, I, I did overlap a little bit, and I, I uh, uh, first of all, he he. I, I think the the difference. Um, the big difference is that we do have different roles. He is a, not just, he's not a TV critic, he's a TV reporter, right? Okay. So his work um, is firmly, and you know, he is a, the Late Shift is a, you know, a magnificent work of reporting, of culture yep. reporting and business reporting. Yep. Uh, and of course I read it um, and it was, I loved it as a, and, and of course, in a lot of ways, the whole genre of Late Night ha will never be bigger and uh, I mean, then the late yeah. night wars era, it really shows you how um, important the the press is. I mean, yeah. the, I think, you know, you're seeing a time when a lot of culture coverage is depleting um, around the country and people, some, I think some misguided um, artists and creators are like good riddance, but you know, the, the Bill Carter created more interest in late night, I would argue, than almost anybody else. Um, <laughs> They uh, because that's when it became not just something from, um, you know, page six of the culture section. It became a front page story. These these became major uh, figures in the news, right? And um, and they, you know, that that wasn't the case as much before or after in some ways. But so he his book was very much a work of reporting about this period of time. I am, uh, you know, a critic and a reporter, um, and I see my the book is a biography but it's very much a biography um with a critic's point of view on it which is yep. to say like it has <clears throat> it it focuses more on the 80s than the other era because i make a decision that from a, that that was the more you know path-breaking formative years yep. um that, that's a critic's choice and then i apply sort of reporting skills to what i do in that and then and including every decision of what i focus on is like a is um you know sort of my my critics hat balancing between that and the reporter's hat um but um it's funny i grew up in washington dc and you know one of the things is there was a lot of very uh powerful television writers all over the country. Um, Bill mm -hmm. Carter just wrote that book, but in where I grew up, Tom Shales was the most, was huge. I read, yeah. I read Tom, Sh every story Tom Shales wrote. He was the most powerful TV critic in the country, more much more powerful than anyone at the New York Times. He was at the yeah. Washington Post. He was at my hometown paper. Um, in retrospect, it's actually odd to me that the most powerful TV critic in the country was not the New York Times, but the Washington Post. Maybe it shouldn't be odd, but that that the um, Tom Shales was not, not only was he um, were her, his reviews powerful, but he had kind of a public profile. He was he was when Larry Sanders wanted to cast some TV critic, they asked Tom <laughs> Shales, and Tom Tom Shales was how again I learned about a lot of culture, a lot of television. It's it's it, he helped me think about um, criticism. Um, and you know it's funny. A lot of um, you you often hear um, comedians, actors talk about, oh, I I saw this comic and it made me realize what's possible. And I, that's the way I feel about Tom. People like Tom Shales or Janet Maslin, and then later Pauline Kael. But actually, before her, it really was when I was a little kid. 
And I worry that kids don't read the paper anymore. You know, they yeah. don't read this stuff. But I, the reason I'm a critic today is because of people like Tom Shales writing about um, late night with a seriousness, like it mattered, right? Totally. You can disagree with them. You can think he was wrong. And a lot of people did. You know, I just recently saw Conan, you know, he, people, he was like, it doesn't matter. The you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to mention Conan with Tom Shales in a second, but yeah, keep going. Uh, I really, yeah. I got to say, like, I mean, I, 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 I think Conan understands this now, but I, I feel like it, it's really important to the art form to have critics just take it seriously. It's yes. more important. Um, they're going to get things wrong, just like artists are going to do good work and bad work, right? Sure. The job is not to get things right, right? The job, and I think what you found- It's to was, spark debate. It's to spark dialogue. In yes. some ways, getting wrong is more useful because yes. our quote unquote wrong. It, to, to have someone to argue against as a young reader was exciting. It made, it raised the stakes for late night in a way that I don't think people always understand. And now we're at a moment when a lot of branches of criticism are disappearing. You know, I, I, then I was became a theater critic. There's all sorts of cities that don't have theater critics anymore. Yeah. So there's just not that discussion. And when you don't have that discussion, you you have either a, a really depleted, stupider kind of discussion, um, yeah. or you have none at all. So anyways, the point being is that, yes, I did read the Bill Carter book, but to be honest with you, when I was a young kid, what I was less interested in like the, the business machinations, the behind the scenes um, corporate intrigue, which I became yeah. much more later on, than I was in reading the reviews um, of, of Letterman and people being like, what is this thing? Like, what is he trying to do here? This is very bizarre. Um, you know, there was a sense I remember there was like little mini controversies in the middle mid eighties about how he was mean to guests. Yes. And I remember reading about some of that and, and this being controversial share famously. Um, of course. That's probably the most famous one I would think. Yeah. Called him, yeah. An, called him an asshole and, yeah. you know, Shirley McLean and this thing. And I remember reading about this and then watching and then keeping an eye out for that and actually being excited by it. Like the, totally. the, the hostility and the tension, the thing that in the media they presented as a negative seemed to me obvious. And again, this is a case where like, it didn't matter that they got it wrong. The fact that they mentioned it, put it on my radar. And then I developed my own opinion, which was, this is amazing. This guy is you know, showing contempt for, for celebrities and show business figures in a way that you don't see anywhere else. Um, and it adds a level of unpredictability and excitement and tension and drama that um, made it all the more riveting. I uh, uh, we had a moment on our show that 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 puts the exclamation point on what you just said. Dave Rogalski, uh, who was a writer for the for for Late Night for years, um, he came on the show and he talked about his reaction to seeing him in college because he was one of these. The, you talk about these phases, you know, you had your first phase, the Downey phase. Once they left and it went into the next phase, is all discussed in the book. Everybody, you gotta like I say, I, if, if 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 you're watching this show, heavens, you will like this book way more than you like this show because it talks about exactly what we're what we're talking about here. Um, you know, and he talked about this girl he was dating in college. He was the college audience watching what was going on, probably probably in the Downey years, I would think, actually. Um, and he talked about his girlfriend, how People Magazine had come out and People Magazine became this thing. And the girl he was dating had all these pictures up in her dorm from People Magazine hanging on the wall. And it was kind of that 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 sort of teen beat almost mentality that was just starting at the time and how within watching Letterman for six months, all those pictures were torn down and, and the idea of making fun of celebrity yeah. um, and, 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 and Letterman really like, again, you talk about the revolutionary aspects of Dave and, and, and how much path of the jungle they actually cleared to what is now a comedy highway that we get to enjoy now. Um, and, and, and it isn't talked about enough. Um, and, and Dave, whenever Dave is, is brought up, like Seinfeld's tried to bring it up to him in the past, uh, when cameras on and whatnot, and Dave just, he pushes it aside, you know, you change TV forever. And Dave, I don't want to talk about it. And the only way Seinfeld could even get him to accept it by, was by saying, and I'm not going to say for the better. And finally Dave kind of accepts this, but he did, he changed everything. And your book does a phenomenal job, um, talking about that. Already to our audience, we can tell that um, 
I use the phrase and far too often probably, but a fisherman can always under uh, can always recognize another fisherman. Um, I see that in you. Now, that being said, I want to fast forward to the point where you're at the New York Times. You were a theater critic, uh, background in mental health history, which also I love because I got my podcasting chops because I host a men's mental wellness podcast as well. Um, so so I, I love all of this. And suddenly now you are the idea of doing a Letterman book where Carter's previous books, different obviously than what you did, the critic mindset, you've done a good job setting the table. I want to know about like, where did this pitch come from? Um, was there any imposter syndrome in the sense that why are you the guy to write this book? And 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 when did you decide to grab hold of that lightning bolt and be the guy? Was it someone else's suggestion? Was it your ambition? It's a great question. Uh, it, it was a long process, and I, 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 I think the idea was sort of ambient because there's only so many um, ideas for books that can justify m many years of work. That I, you know, and he is certainly one of them. Yeah. Um, but I think it, I did have an an, uh, uh, an agent came to me with the idea. I said no. Um, and then I remember distinctly. Um, being, and I, I, I had a, my first child, um, and I was on the, she was a baby and I was at the, or, you know, very young and I was in the playground, not a baby. She was, she, I guess she was running around, but she was yeah. in the playground. And I remember my dad calling me and telling me that David Letterman died. I mean, I, I'm sorry. David Letterman retired. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, not, not died. He, that he, that he Good one, dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that he announced he's uh, retiring, right? Yeah. For a, a year before his went off the air. And I, at the, I, it was at that moment that I thought to myself, oh, someone's going to do this. Right. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, of course, I've had imposter syndrome here and there, but I have a healthy enough ego to think <laughs> that, that, that I would do a good job at this because I did feel like I was the perfect age and I had, um, I, my my really strong feeling is is that um it needed uh i had you know someone who understood the 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 appeal of letterman that being a fan helped but i think it really required what i wanted to do was not write a fan's book right right i wanted to write a book that was a reporter's book that had some dispassion um and uh, and also could talk to everybody. I mean, that was really important to me that yep. I, it wasn't going to be through my voice. I wanted to talk to every, and you know, the times helps on that, um, that uh, all the, well, I started with a very strong position that I wasn't going to look at this through an auteur lens, which is to say, you can only understand David Letterman's show through David Letterman. All incredible number of talented people, some of whom have been in your podcast have worked on the show and are key players. And honestly, like that was both the most fascinating uh, and most fun part of the process of writing the book was getting to know all these different brilliant uh, writers and producers um, and uh, and other kinds of people who played key roles, musicians, uh, archivists like Don Guillory, all, yep. all people who make key roles. But anyways, the point is, is that when I was on the playground, I, I called up the agent right away and I said, on the playground, I said, all right, let's do this. And there was another, there was, a, there was another, uh, uh, I think Kendall single project that also got started then. So I was like your podcast, but you, you're, you're worried about the podcast beating you to the punch. I was that, I remember looming very large in my mind. It seems silly now, but yep. it was a very, it was a big motivating factor. And it's funny. I, if I was to look at like, all right, what would I do differently with that book? And you know, I, I like what what are the criticisms that I think are were were good or that worth like, you know, there's a version of the book that's much longer. Um, that's that that digs into uh, you know, goes to much more detail into the, the last show, the, the the you know, the CBS show. And You're I taking think words out of my mouth here. Okay, good. This is I good. I have a question on that. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I think you know, in the, a lot of people that was like a uh, that was one criticism of the book. Yeah. And now I've had enough years of distance to be like, there's there's some merit to that. I, I think that there's uh of that the book could be twice as long. The yeah. it was definitely a, a choice to not make it so because I've never liked these big doorstop um bios that are only for the the people who are obsessed with the person. That yeah. said, there as there are so many of those people that it's not a niche group, right? And do 
it, is it possible to do, I always wanted to write a book on David Letterman that would make fans happy, but also make people who just care about cop, pop culture happy. And that was, that's challenging. That's how I've always viewed my career. That's the hardest part about my job is that to, to write about comedy in a, in a, with nuance and sophistication that doesn't lose people who are just like smart people who are casually and interested. That's, that's by far the hardest part of my job and people underestimate how difficult that is. Um, so, but I, I think I, it, you know, I, there's a version of this book that's like a twice as long that I perhaps could have done and made, might've been a better idea, but one, there was that that thought I had that like, all right, I, I want to keep them wanting more. But two, frankly, there was the sense of time. I was yeah. like, oh no, I, I want to get this book out. You know, I, I, I don't want to be beat by somebody else writing a book that, which now seems ridiculous. Um, and um, and uh, so, you know, those those were, and you know, the timing turned out very, very well in the sense that when I talked to Letterman, he, the show was over and I think it was a much better interview because of that. Yes. Um, and I also think that it was enough time from like, say when Meryl Marco was working on the show that she, um, you know, was an excellent source as were so many of the writers, you know, Max and Tom and all yeah. these, you know, George Meyer and, and, and uh, Hal Gurney. I mean, you know, it's funny. My, I wrote a book on horror movies in the seventies Um uh was my first book. Yeah. And I published it about 10 years ago. And one thing I really clear is clarifying almost all the, I, another book, I reported the hell out of it, talked to hundreds of people, all the, the makers of night of living dead and Rosemary's baby and Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. And, and, you know, almost all like maybe like three quarters of my sources have died in the last three. And you realize that's an added responsibility because Oh, you're the last person to do these long form interviews. Yep. These artists with the are one of the last people. And that's going to happen here too. The, I, luckily, not that many people from the Letterman book have died. I mean, Dave's mom died and his mother didn't. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that, 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 they, that is a responsibility. There, there's a period of time when you can write these books. Yes. And, um, and you can write them, you could write them 50 years from now by looking at the work, but it's not the same. And I wanted, it was very important to me to root it in reporting and talking to Barbara Gaines and talking to all these people, talking to whoever I could get to talk to me and trying to understand it on the inside as well as the outside. Um, yeah. So anyways, the point is that's a long winded way. I, I, I just, at that point, I decided to do it. I was, I was nervous about it because I didn't know if Letterman would talk to me and it's a different book if he talks to me versus if he does talk to me, it's a, there's a good version. That being said, you had it written. You basically had the book written before you talked to Dave, uh, which I think is a, is a, is a, is a fascinating part in itself um, because I've read the book. I read the book twice. Then uh, since I started the podcast, I've read it again. And in part of the prep is listening to you on Marin talk about that. When you are on Marin's podcast, talking about the fact that you had a book, like you were ready to go. And, yeah. um, and, and then you talked to Dave and then you tinkered with the book. Did you give Dave any treatments before you talked to him? Treatments meaning what? Oh, sorry. Any incarnations of the book already that you, anything that you had written so far oh, or was it uh, clean? Okay. So okay. you came and met him uh, clean. Well, yeah, I mean that, that was, uh, that was non-negotiable, right? So I'm like the, the, the I didn't want to write a authorized biography. In fact, there, there's enough of those, right? Yep. There's too many of those, both in biographies and documentaries. Like yep. again, what I can bring to the table is that I think I can I can get people to talk to me, but uh, a little bit of distance is invaluable. Is yeah. invaluable. Um, and um, you know, I think that, uh, and I think also, frankly. I don't think Letterman wanted to do an authorized biography, right? And I think- It's not um, his style. <laughs> it's not his style. And it also allows him to have some distance from it, yeah. you know, like he doesn't, I think, um, so I think, it, you know, in a weird way, it helped because I don't think he wants to sit down and talk about himself and have his name attached to it. That's not, um, so, um, but, you know, I think when I finally did sit down with him, um, the advantage of already doing so much work yeah, is that I could be like, oh, I don't need to dig around for stuff. Um, yeah. I can say, and and you know, I was very 
transparent. I was like, here's what I heard. You know, some stuff was he. I thought he might not like some stuff, he might, but he at no point, to his credit, was defensive, or um, I mean, he wasn't negative about anything. No. Uh, I mean, if anything, right? Of course, the classic Letterman move is to um, blame himself, sure. right? Take credit, right? And that is his own. That's his own reflex. Um, so you know, a lot of this is also like. The tricky thing is you're sort of living in the psychology of your your biograph bio, uh, biographical subject. Yeah. And when it comes to Letterman, as any of the writers will tell you, <laughs> that is a difficult place to be. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, he's I am a come from a long line of Jewish neurotics. <laughs> uh, Letterman is a Gentile Midwestern neurotic. Yeah. There is some overlap between uh, the two, but they are different. They are different. Clipper, uh, crippling Lutheran guilt, I think, is a phrase that he has used before in the past. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yep. It is. It is. And it was important to me to spend time in Indiana. It was important to spend time in, in Broad Ripple and Ball State. Yep. It was important to me to spend time in LA the comedy store, all of the, it was important to me to spend time on his radio show, yep. uh, with his radio show colleagues. Cause I think that's a very, again, let the, the eighties is a long time ago, but the sixties is also a really long time ago. Yeah. And that's really formative to under, I mean, Letterman was born, was he born in 47? He was born around the it, same. Yeah. I think it was 47. Yeah. Around the same time television was. Yeah. So yeah. it's, um, it is a, uh, you know, I think, it was, it felt to me like it was important to do this book because this is a kind of history that people are going to already forget. If they're already forgetting it now. Like yep. uh, television itself doesn't mean what it de did. A lot of the jokes in the eighties were about television and they only make sense in a world without the internet. <laughs> like, yes. like, like the joke um, that he would say, like he would often say, this is the only thing that's on NBC right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Something, something stupid was going on. And he would be like, that was hilarious <laughs> to me at the time. Right. It was hilarious. I, and it felt like this, like, little kid who got control of this powerful thing and he was messing around with it and not taking yep. it seriously. It felt very irreverent. It goes back to your question about why do people obsess about it? It's hard to really understand now to look at him because he seems so middle American. So, you know, he's like a uh, so accessible. He's like an older white guy with, you know, you know, conservative out clothes, but he felt countercultural. Yes. Um, in the context of television in that day, in the context of the tonight show, in the context of what you can do on television. I just watched, I'll make one last point and I'll shut up. No, please don't. This is great. Joe, Joe Grossman, who was a, uh, uh, another key figure in me decided to do the book because I worked with Joe Grossman at Time Out New York. Before. Oh my God. I love hearing this. Okay. So he, I love I, Joe Grossman. he was before I, I did any reporting, I knew one Letterman writer, right? <laughs> and that was Joe Grossman. I worked right next to him for, for years. And, <laughs> um, and then he got a job working for David Letterman, which seemed incredibly cool. Right. And I remember, um, you know, contacting him and, and asking him, I think I went to, I might've even gone to the office to at, to be like, I got this idea. What do you think of the, I, now I don't mind. I think at the time I wanted to keep him out of it because I didn't want him to get in trouble if there was something that people didn't like, you know. The, yep. uh, and he was, and he was very loyal. Didn't say anything negative or whatever. But, but, but um, <laughs> um, Joe did a video that just came out this week, which I recommend yep. everyone to see. Uh, one of the staff favorites, the the Letterman. I I hope Don doesn't take offense at this because Don, I always am loyal to Don's videos, which are incredible. But it is wonderful to see these staff. Uh, selected collections of videos as well. Yes. And Joe um, talks about, from a comedy point of view, how you couldn't diagram these jokes that he was watching as a kid. And he, they show a clip of this one monologue joke he did where he says, you know, um, me and a bunch, of, I was like, I'm paraphrasing, and a bunch yeah. of volunteer firefighters, you know, went over to the house and tried to shove a canned ham down a toilet. <laughs> and that was the joke. <laughs> You, I mean, that could not be come up with in nope. a writer, right? Or nope. it couldn't, it just, it, it, and Joe was saying like, I don't know why that was funny, but it was, <laughs> right? It was. And I, I mean, I know intuitively exactly what he meant. So I knew Joe and I also knew, I remember asking Joe, I was like, what's he, what's Letterman like? 
And I think he told me something like he'd met him twice yeah. and it was only on air. And yeah. I was, I was stunned. Yeah. Right? And I was like, that's interesting. Like it is. Like, that's really interesting. Like Larry, first, first of all, it made me think like, you know, Larry Sanders really was a good show. Yes. <laughs> and there's of course, you know, Paul Sims worked with Larry, a lot of letter yep. writers, Larry Sanders. Um, uh, but also, you know, the late period Letterman was this fascinating, like kind of Kremlinology of, you know, there was the guy at the center and the people writing the jokes for him often had very little contact with him, except on air. Joe yeah. would talk to him on air. So I, I was like, from a, um, this is a fascinating ecosystem to try to capture. Yes. And of course, one of the key themes, I think, that I tried to map out in the book is that ecosystem was very different in 2010 than it was in 1995, than it was in 1988 during the, or during the strike year, yep. which was a turning point, than it was, you know, or then it was really forgotten you know, the early years, you had all these Harvard Lampoon writers who didn't really respect Letterman that much, or, or yeah. not, that, that's maybe too harsh, but they they thought they knew it was funny and he didn't, right? Yes. And um, he wasn't this famous guy. Um, and then that, on top of that, you have Meryl Marco, who was, a you know, a peer um, and obviously a romantic interest, right? So there, there's, the, the, these dynamics- There's a lot of tapestry here all critical to understanding why the show worked and it worked in multiple different dynamics yes. worked, but yes. they all made very different, uh, different shows. And, uh, and that's the kind of thing I think the other, uh, the other thing that I felt like, Oh, I have to do this book is that I was surrounded by a lot of culture journalists who knew very well the difference between the Simpsons season three yes. and Simpsons season 11. Yep. That the real comedy fans, the, like to say, oh, the Simpsons, uh, no, no, no. There's the yep. Simpsons season, the Simpsons season one is different than Simpsons season four. Just like the Wire season four is fundamentally different than the Wire season. And I felt like, you know, people don't know that about Letterman. Um, in that kind of granular detail. No. That, that That's why if that was the critics. I was like, I want to put this in a permanent situation where like people could disagree with me or whatever, but at least they could have something to argue about. We're like, look, the, the, this Letterman show in from, from this period was totally different. Not just the, the, the late night to late show, but within late night, there were all these different, wildly different periods. Yep. And it's and it's fun because uh, you know the Simpsons is a great example of of, of a comparison uh, because I mean how many how many seasons are we at the Simpsons now 30, 33, right. something like that whatever it is yeah. I mean yeah it's 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 very cool because now you see people and this is why I love you talk about the timing of things and 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 also man can I ever relate to the idea of what if another book comes out that sort of thing that's where I'm at right now like I'm I'm there going okay. We're going to be the ones that do the deep dive. I actually want to work for pants. I want to compliment what's coming out because what's coming out. And, and again, to your point about Don's videos, Don's video, I love Don's video so much. Like when he goes through, you know, seven parts of all of the talk show hosts who have ever had any interaction with David Letterman. And here they are in chronological order. I'm like, sign me up. Let's do this. Let's make some popcorn. I'm, I'm in, but then I'll watch. What Walter and the team, and and you know Don's part of that too, but we don't talk about that very very much. But but uh, you know the, the Walter and the team putting out these beautiful, even for YouTube standards, they're a little long. Like you know YouTube's like oh yeah three to five minutes all that. I think Joe's video was fourteen or fifteen minutes or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I can appreciate both of what you're talking about, but in the timing of this show, um, I'm a seventy six baby. So, so I didn't, I didn't get to see the downy stuff uh, of late night era of late night early on. You know, I wasn't one of those guys, by the way, yes. Another reason to buy Jason's book is to listen or to read um, uh, the parts of Dave back in Indiana for the radio stuff. I could not agree more his university years. Like you want to talk about the sowing the seeds of somebody who likes to uh, uh, be a, a, an annoyance to power. Or when he believes in something, wants to, uh, yeah, okay, let's 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 protest a little bit here. Let's be funny, um, you know. 
There it is right there. Thank you, Don. There it is. Letterman, the last giant of late night. Jason Zinneman. We're going to find out if there's a, if it's possible to get signed copies still later on, but it's definitely available on the Amazons. So jump in, grab it. Uh, these stories are all fantastic. But where I was going to talk about the timing of this show, I'm glad I'm a little bit younger on this side of it. Because when Grossman and I were talking, or or Lee Ellenberg and I were talking, um, it's cool. I remember seeing Joe Grossman for the very first time uh, when he showed up um, in an extended role. I think his first time was a crowd shot. But watching Late Show and going, oh my God, he's a writer. He's, a, he's just like me. He's a Gen Xer just like me. He's yeah. a guy who actually got to, and I mean, the stories, and you do a good job talking about how the ecosystem of pants did such a good job of promoting from within as opposed to bringing out in uh, outsiders after a certain point that was a phase that they were and some of the greatest comedy writers out there didn't ever intend to be a comedy writer they came and they showed up as an intern right. and 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 became that but right. you look at these generations of people for the simpsons for letterman who were inspired by it entertained by it um uh, you know and and then suddenly it was their dream to kind of be part of it and then they were and are a part of it and now we're seeing the other the tail end of it where where's Grossman work now where's Ellenberg work now they work for the Tonight Show they work for they work for Fallon and it's it's amazing to watch the evolution continue and and these different generations that have put their mark on it because they were inspired by one or two generations before um and it is too big to put it if you were to take it all and put it all into one book but that's where uh, the fragmentation of entertainment now as to where we're at is a benefit because you do have these yep. deep dive podcasts that may only be there for a few, you know, well, a few hundred thousand people. Let's say that for both you and my sake, that 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 we both have a few hundred thousand people in our uh, perspective markets, you know, for an author or for, 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 for Letterman who do want to take that deep dive, who do want to go on these journeys, uh, to be there because it is so big. Um, I want to go back. So thank you very much. You, you've, you've done a, a phenomenal, um, job, much, much, much better than I could ever do explaining some of these things, uh, that we're, we're looking at here. Um, and again, you've taken that reporter mentality, which, I get this question a lot from people already, even though we're only the size that we are right now. And I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of ask it to you because I would love to hear your perspective. You clearly were a huge fan. You clearly are a gifted writer and reporter and critic with that mentality. Um, for me personally, I know it's actually really easy to switch hats or to to do that because the fandom, I have such a deep level of respect for it that it's extremely easy for me to put on the other hat and just, and, and you know, kind of dig into it. Um, you had the book written, Dave sat down with you. Uh, I mean, that probably, w were there any moments along the way where you were just like, okay, hold on a second. And you got really present as a fan and went, holy shit. Like, like was it your first couple interviews? Like who, who, who did you meet with at the beginning where you kind of went, all right, well, this, this project, this is actually a lot of fun because that part got to be itched too, maybe even in the background. Right, right, right. The um, <laughs> honestly, the um, it actually is. I, I hate to say this because it's not an interesting answer, but it's it, it it it's it happened more rarely. It happened fairly rarely because this I, I do once I kind of it becomes work. You're locked in. Yeah. I'm locked in. I am yep. not, I, I, I am not, I've never, you know, it's been not since I was in my twenties that I was intimidated by celebrity or any yeah. of that stuff from press, but like, I think, which again is an asset with Letterman because he, of course, had to, now there was him. He, he wasn't either. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's undeniable that Letterman meant so much to me as a kid. I mean, I, I, um, I imitated him as a kid. My sensibility is infused with it. My, you know, it's so important. The, yeah. the when I met with Letterman, honestly, I was so ang I was mostly anxiety ridden about getting what I needed. The the points where I had like to pinch myself, and part of this is just the joy of writing. A, there, there's a lot of writing a book is horrifically uh, is uh, anxiety producing, yes. and it's, it's a really really hard thing to do. Um, yes. Any for anyone to do. It's and. For most of the time, I mean, like, I, if I, here's what I compare it to. Like, if I'm writing a story for that, you know, I have four days to write it. There's a period of like two and a half days where I'm not quite sure what it is, or I know parts of it, but I don't know the whole puzzle. And you have to sit with that anxiety. And then there's a moment when it clicks in, which you haven't 
executed it, but you kind of know what it's going to be. Sometimes it's a day. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's like a quick write. It's a couple hours. The book is like that, but with like three years, right? So yeah. you're sitting with this anxiety of all these things you don't know. And it's kind of, you kind of never leaves you. So you're, and uh, that, and that's, it's incredibly hard, but the nice thing about it is because it's a long-term project and the reporting of it is requires a lot of time. Yeah. You have to win and you have to win people's trust. You have to stop. If you want to do with, with some kind of complexity and nuance it requires getting a lot of um, primary sources. And I got to know a lot of these people. I mean, I think the best example is Meryl Marco. And there are times uh, when I did pinch myself, I still do pinch myself that, you know, I've got to know her yeah. and, and there was periods when like, I would be talking to her on a daily basis. And, you know, it's a w weird relationship between writer and source because they know, like, I am a writer who's going to write what I'm going to write. Right. I'm not going to pat, I'm not going to give her the final, you know, okay. But you're also kind of like, you, you can't help but become friendly. Right. Yeah. So for instance, Meryl is a big fan of reality, uh of, of we're both fans of reality like dating shows right <laughs> so like so occasionally like when you're like between interviews we'll like start talking about you know love is blind on netflix or whatever and that's the point where i'm like man if you would have told me as a kid that i would be talking i'd be like joking around about a reality or a tv show with meryl marco yeah like what a life i have that's that, yep. that that actually is because that's like i'm not it's not about i'm doing my job it's I'm just like, I'm just like a friend. Like you're hanging out talking about this TV show, right? Yep. And of course she's as funny as she is talking about that as she is on the show. So th th those, and I do think- um, She's a dream guest for us, by the way. So Meryl, I know you're not listening or watching, but if somebody who knows her ever sees a clip of this, she is an absolute dream guest for us. Well, there is, there is this tricky thing because, um, you know, at the same time, you know, she had some of the most valuable, not just insights, but- I figured primary sources, you know, she kept a diary. The diaries, yes. Yeah, and you know, to some degree, and you, you'll, you know this as well as I do, talking to people is invaluable, but when you're talking to people about something that happened three decades ago, memory is flawed, narratives get established and hard to break. Yep. There's ways to do it. If you get multiple, if you talk to multiple people and ask them about the same thing, you can get closer to the truth, right? The top 10 list being a great example of that. Yeah. A fantastic example of that, right? Yeah. So there's, um, but not, what's better, the other way to get around it than getting multiple perspectives, which you do, is to get at hard primary sources, right? Things that people wrote at that, or to watch. I mean, that was the first thing I needed to do was to watch all the shows. And that was something that, you know, Don was invaluable for. But yeah. also, um, you know, to get people's, the, 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 the scripts for sketches, the, 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 the Meryl eventually did, she didn't want at first, but she did let me have, see some of these um, things that she wrote from like, you know, after meeting Letterman for the first time at the comedy store or whatever, coming back and writing about it in your journal, you can't replace that. I can't, nope. no, no memory is going to do that. So that, that well, it's a combination of, of the fact and the emotion at the same time where the fact is actually right. Uh, you know, you didn't get the day wrong because you wrote it that day, but the emotion is also attached to it at the same time. And it's one of those moments where they're actually in con incongruency with each other. Yes. Yes. No, I mean, I've become more convinced than ever through writing the books, my as opposed to doing journalism, where you do these like long form reporting projects of the value of um, like a disinterested reporter. Um, because everybody tells like, if you tell, just think about your own life. Like, yep. you, like you have a good story that you tell to impress somebody about a funny thing that happened to you. Sure. Once, once you tell it a couple times, you you're remembering telling that story, not the actual incident. Yep. And you can't. That was just human. Just human, right? And those narratives get hardened and if, as you get older. Like maybe you're telling the like the story of how you met your wife or how you your parents. You, whatever do you love your parents here's a story about how why your mom is great do you hate your parents here's a story about why yeah but it, they get they get so hard and it, it gets in the way of the truth in a lot of instances totally it's like a stand-up routine right like you're working on stand-up on stage and you find the moments where there's the laughs and so you start moving towards that and that's why a bit 
can start at this, maybe a funny thing that happened at the supermarket and turn into something completely different by the time it hits the special, right? Like it's, it's a completely different, um, and, and our binds do that. You know, Steve Weiner, by the way, Don Giller said the top 10 is his idea. Um, uh, Steve Weiner said to me, he goes, I appreciate Don Giller so much because he is my memory because Don, Steve will talk about how he remembered things and will tell people things completely wrong. And by the time, you know, it gets back to Don where he finds out the truth, where the, the, the true hardline fact archivist actually, you know, hands it to him. He was off by a year or he's off by six months or it was uh, that other guest as opposed to this. And he's combined these two stories. And it's a trippy feeling when you actually have somebody that can give the total truth uh, as it actually happened based on the perception of truth that we've built over the years. The truth, right. There's the like truth, the, right? And yeah, that's, there's like the, the truth is very, I mean, Steve Weiner is an incredible interview. Oh, I love him. Also, just besides being just a really smart guy who loves comedy, right? Yep. And knows a lot about comedy. And, um, but you know, he's a young guy working in a big job with a lot of egos where yep. you get no credit, right? Like that's the other thing. That's the, that's the fundamental dynamic I realized with Letterman show. And you'll, you figure this out too, which is that like, what's it like to work at a place where you're going to get no credit. Okay. So the only credit you're going to get, or you, you get no credit publicly. It's a very yep. public show. Yep. You're going to get no credit publicly. So the credit you get is like, you know, Oh, somebody said, Hey, good, good, good job. Or, yep. or, somebody laughed in a room or say someone doesn't like you, which is the, of course, who every office has these right. And there was certainly in those early Letterman sh shows, there were rivalries, there were petty bickerings. Yep. There were a lot of ugly, the usual, you know, the usual office shit. Um, yep. And um, so everyone's got these very, and you know, I think about my first jobs and I have very strong emotional feelings about people there. People you can put yourself right back into it. Everybody into it. And I, yep. I, what I've learned as, you know, decades as a reporter is to be very skeptical of my own memory of events. Um, what a great skill to have. It's what, what's invaluable. Like I, it's one, one of the reasons I really treasure old friends. Um, I mean, obviously like they know you better than they have all this history, but now as I get older, I'm like, Oh, I learn a lot about myself yeah. from these people who remember, remember things. Um, I mean, I was just at a, a bar, a bar mitzvah this over this last weekend with a guy who I've known since I was in my early twenties. And there was like, they were dancing and it was dancing. And this guy came over to me and he's like, Oh, it's great that you brought back the Jay Z. And I was like, what? And his old memory popped up that like when I was in my early twenties, I created my own dance called the, <laughs> and I named it the Jay Z. <laughs> How embarrassing. How No wonder I willfully forgot it. No wonder. <laughs> like, all these memories are like, oh yeah, I was in New York and I would be at these parties and they'd be like, do the Jay-Z and I would do this dance. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, and I let, I was both, you know, it's been long enough that I'm only a little bit embarrassed. Now I'm just love having this memory, right? But yes. uh, I completely blanked out. I completely forgotten that. That well, and again, going back to the going back to the book, and I hate to be a broken record uh, about it, but that's the thing. That's the line that you expertly um, you know, stayed on the entire time was that you would bring back these memories that would trigger, if you did see it on TV, it would trigger the joy. If you didn't see it, it would trigger the uh, excitement, the emotion to want to actually go and seek out the memory of what happened. But then also the fact on the other side of it as well, uh, the commentary as well, you know, and 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 not glossing over things. And, and you did such a damn good job of it. It was, it, it's such a good book. Um, so I want to go back to well, I want to go back to Dave for a second um, because I don't want to go too far removed from the original question. The book was basically written. You meet with Dave. Um, you knew that there were things that you wanted to get out there, things like ask him about certain things so you could kind of corroborate or confirm things from the source. Okay, that's fine. But was there one or two things that fundamentally changed the manuscript? from that oh, yeah. meeting with Dave? Like, was there, is there anything that's kind of overarching? Is there one that's one or two that are above everything else? No, I, I wouldn't say it was totally written. It, it definitely changed a lot. The, the, okay. the interview definitely shifted. I went back over everything. Yeah. Um, but, um, and I would say that like, uh, 
there was a lot of um uh I, for them i mean i hate to he, his you the the meeting with him i i you know this is going to sound convenient but it confirmed what a lot of what i already thought was which was rooted in what all the other writers told me which isn't is that, that great isn't that is great the, like that yeah. makes you feel so good in the moment where you're like yes but then you've you got know. to question it. Then you've got to question it because it's like, like for instance, since since he's the kind of person to always not take credit. Right. Right. Do, 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 you know, are you going too far? Because the writers are incentivized on some level to take credit because they've never gotten their credit. And now here's their chance. Letterman is, is not going to take credit because that's his personality. Um, and so you've got to be careful on that front too. But, you know, there were hmm. things like the... Um, uh, the, his first wedding, which is how I, the first, I start the book with where I was like, you know, I'm like an old school newspaper journalist that needs two sources for a, for something to be publishable. Yeah. Right. Uh, and obviously there are only so many people in the room. Um, and, and he was married in secret and he was which married makes it even harder. So having him, having his eyewitness, there were a lot of things that, I mean, this is like a little like report behind the scenes reporting stuff that wouldn't have been in the book if I didn't have his sourcing. Um, there you go. The, so that was huge. That's a great uh, answer to the question that I'm asking. Yeah, if you got more of those, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I was asking for stuff like that. that. That's the biggest difference is the, and I think it was important because it gave like the kind of deep, the novelistic detail to a lot of the scenes. Yes. Um, and that's included for some difficult subjects. I mean, that's the thing, you know, about the affair and about the, the intern, all that stuff. He didn't dodge anything. He didn't dodge anything. Right. He had, he, um, and so that, not that that stuff wouldn't have been in the book, but it was, it, it was able to be fleshed out in a way. Um, and, um, so, yeah, and then, you know, it was also just useful to get, I think, the early days in particular, stuff with his, you know, again, it's been a while, but stuff with his dad was mm -hmm. really key. Obviously, like his dad was an alcoholic. Yeah. Who went to a meeting and took Letterman. And Letterman had this one memory that, and this is, you know, there's a, I started the book with a bunch of questions, um, which I think is the best way to start a book to not questions which you genuinely don't know the answer to and you're not and you're open to going in many different directions yeah don't start with an agenda one of which is like how does this conservative a uh, so you know socially conservative midwestern guy create this avant-garde alternative to the tonight show right another one is you know why did this guy who was a successful indiana broadcaster yeah drop everything and leave and to go to Los Angeles to be a stand-up comedian when his nature was kind of cautious. Um, and um, and so you get this piece, which is that, you know, his dad went to a meeting, brought him along. And the way he describes it, his dad was like this performer. Yeah. Right? And, but he was a performer whose ambitions, you know, from Letterman's point of view, which is all that matters, and because I'm in this case, yeah. um, were stifled. So that was a key psychological piece to being like, all right, I have a chance to get out of here. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to take this risk. And I'm also later on going to stop drinking, by the way. Yeah. You know, which is, which, you know, that's another way to write this book you know, is to be like, here's the story of a guy, a guy. I mean, I think there's a couple through lines. There's Letterman and relationship with women, which is a key through line that I try to keep through the whole book. Yeah. There's you know, including on screen and off. Meg Parson is one of his fate the fact that letterman told me that like if you want to really understand what my sh the show is about look at the stuff i did with meg parson which I, again intersects with my me as a viewer i loved that stuff with meg parson and no one really remembers it and doesn't nope. get it. and i went i you know that was actually a pinch moment. i went to go see meg parson who still lives in new york and was, and um that was a fascinating like reality show version of a romantic comedy um, that kind of anticipated a lot of culture today, I would argue. But anyways, so you learn stuff like that, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, his stuff with his dad and his mom and this family stuff was definitely helped a lot yep. by the interview. I, I, ironically, I would say the like on show bits, less so. Yeah. Less yeah. so. That makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, well, uh, again, I've done 50 of these. All right. 
you start throwing out to me details and I've had it happen again. It's a micro micro level where somebody discovers the show for the first time and, and throws something at me from one of the very, very early episodes. Oh yeah. And it jogs the memory. I can only imagine after thousands upon thousands of shows, you know, that stuff all blurs itself together, but the stuff you're talking about doesn't the stuff that you're talking about is it's, it's very different. And, uh, I appreciate that. I want to go back to Meryl for a second, uh, yeah. because again, you know, we had Casey St. Ong on our show and she said this, and I've repeated it ad nauseum since she is the mother of late night television as we know it today. And in, in many ways, uh, the mother of pop culture comedy as, as, as we know it today. Um, I appreciate her so, so, so much. And, and I, I even said to Casey either, I don't, it might've even been on air. Um, if you ask me who I'd rather have on this show as a guest, Meryl or Dave, I'd have to think about it for a second. Like I would, like I just appreciate her so much. And again, I'm a 76 baby. I came along after, but I still recognize and realize that you talk about this little friendship talking about love is blind, by the way, did you see the latest three episodes? The, the, after the year later, Holy oh, I got to catch up. I got to catch up. Candy and I watched them the other night. Uh, worth watching for sure. Uh, a couple surprises in there. Um, anyway, <laughs> Meryl, uh, you actually, as part of the signing, and it's on Don's channel. Uh, shout out to Don Giller's uh, channel there. You can actually watch it. Uh, you did a book signing. And yeah. you actually got to talk to her publicly and interview her publicly. Um I mean, you did a phenomenal job as a reporter and, and and whatnot, but at the end of the day, there's a there's a bit of a a cool PS pinch me kind of moment that you got a chance to do that. Um, I just wanted to say a couple more things about Meryl, like like before we before we kind of move on to other things that I want to talk about. Uh, the idea that she is the mother of 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 comedy in many ways the feminine sensibility that she brought to it in a very male dominated world at the time, the world was just starting to change. I would say that she was probably a keystone in that change happening. How important is Meryl Marco? I mean, I completely agree with that point, right? That she's yeah. the mother of it. And I think that one of the purposes of the book, as I saw it, was to put meat on the bones of that point, right? Um, and, you know, you could... I think again, being a trying to be objective about it, you could argue against it. Like she actually was not there for that long, right? No. You know, she was. If you look at the the sleeve of his career, I think if you don't think that the '80s was the most uh, artistically formative part, it's a harder case to make. Um, so, uh, and it, it's like it, it's also like again, you got to look at the politics of it. Late night has been rife with sexism. Very yep. few women. People want to make this story that there's this important female figure, right? They 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 want sure. to tell the story, right? Just like in the Daily Show is the same thing. The Daily yeah. Show was started by you know Liz Winstead and and uh, Madeline Smith. -Burg. Madeline Smithberg, yeah, yeah. They haven't got their credit, and they've been you know people try to like say oh they but you know let's it became what it was with John Stewart and uh, and um, but you know I looked at the evidence, talked to all of these people. And my considered opinion is like, if you look at the structure of the book, it's in some ways like a case for yeah. why, like a kind of, in, in a way, like a lawyerly case for why Meryl Marco uh, was as important as Letterman to the show, and which consequently means she's as important as anyone to the artistic history of late night television. And, you know, whether you look at her, the, 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 I mean, you could list the things that she invented remotes, you know, um, Stephen Petrick's, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But the broader point is that you have this guy who's good at some things. He's a stand up who's quick on his feet. He's good at responding to things, but ultimately has a kind of uh, a knee jerk irreverence, but he's ultimately kind of a cautious, um, conservative yes. figure. Yep. And you have this, he, what he needed was somebody who had this kind of more bohemian experimental sensibility. Yeah. Um, that to add the zaniness. To add the zaniness and the ambition. Like, yeah. Oh, it, good point. Yeah. It wouldn't be worth doing 50 episodes of a podcast or writing a book on Letterman if it didn't have ambition. Yeah. And if you talk to Letterman, 
he doesn't say I'm doing this great thing. He's like, I'm just, I'm wasting time. Right. And it's not like Meryl's arrogant. She's not, she, uh, no. she but, but she um, could speak in the language of sort of like high end comedy um, that I think was critical, not just to the show, but also to the time, because you have to, if you put, if you add this context of like, she was part of a forerunner of reality television, the, the, the remotes really anticipating the daily show remotes and so much of YouTube today. Yep. Also, like really, um, you know, I, also I think Meryl, as she would tell you, is a word person. That was one of the first conversations she had. She, I was like, what do you mean word person? She's like, you know what I mean? And I was like, all right, just explain it. You know, but she's like, her comedy, she loved Robert Benchley. She loves all these, you know, this kind of New York, these kind of, how many letters that people don't read anymore much? Right. It's like uh, she is um, uh, is where Letterman has this radio background, has this yeah. you know, TV background. It's very different. And but clearly um, vocabulary is something that the two bonded over. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Letterman has a love of language. That, that's a, a good point. It's a good point where it is a case where they the, his his love of the oddball phrase um, is overlaps with her love of language. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, in, in short, she, I, I, I went into the book being like, oh, it would be nice for Meryl to be a big character, dramatically speaking for my book. And also like, oh, it, isn't it nice to be like, okay, in this male dominant industry, there is a cure, but I, I'm going to be open to being wrong about this. Um, and um, what I found was that there's no question that, that all the evidence points to her being absolutely critical. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what's interesting to argue against myself for a second, sure. looking at the Joe Grossman video, <laughs> and this is, again, maybe it might, here's where my book might be wrong, is that they did some weird stuff in that, in late Letterman. Sure. Well, like there's some, there's some weird stuff in late Letterman. So the, there is a sense where like to own to Letterman is, is you know, it's his eccentricity, his zaniness is it is independent of Merrill or George Meyer as well. Right. It's yeah. a different quality. That's why I think ambition is actually the key thing, because I think these kind of like conceptual shows they did that goes yeah. away. The 30 and 60 degree turning around, you know, yeah. the camera angles show. by the way we can't underestimate almost as important um or not almost but really really important and e and almost more forgotten is how 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 it, absolutely just there's there's you know not just a letter but to, to the history of the genre yeah. um and yeah. he was somebody who loved formal experimentation and he was somebody who did things with cutaway shots that you see everywhere now that were really radical um and um, I mean, he saw, have you tried to talk to him before? Well, yeah, I've had a phone conversation with him and traded a couple emails. Um, he has, I, I hope, I still have hope that there's a chance that, that we can get him. Uh, but I feel like he might have said everything that he has wanted to say on the matter and enjoyed traipsing around Ireland uh, a little bit more than, than the idea of this, but I still have, I still do have hope. And I did have a very nice phone conversation with him. Daniel Kellison told me the greatest Hal Gurney story in the entire world. Uh, Kellison wanted to get him to work on, I, I think it might've been the man show uh, again, it all blurs together, but um, <laughs> he wanted to call him out to, to come and Hal Gurney said, okay, but only if you can set up a meeting with me and Harvey Levin from TMZ. <laughs> and and Kellison was like, um, well, and actually probably could make it happen because one of the partners, I think it was of the man show, uh, was 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 in partnership with TMZ. And he said, Well, why? He goes, Well, okay, we'll set up the meeting because I wanna I wanna punch him in the face. <laughs> And that's what Hal Gurney said. If you arrange that, I will come out and direct whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> I love, appreciate Hal Gurney so, so much. Um, by the way, Don has said a couple of things in here. You know, dog poetry, Dave was reluctant. Meryl pushed for it. Um, you know, there's a good example of that. I want to go over to late show stuff, uh, you know, talking to you about this. And you've done a perfect segue. There is one element that Meryl brought to the table that Dave um, made a deal breaker. And that was pranks on the host. And, and, and the idea of pranks on the host, I thought, was a really beautiful thing. Uh, but here's the irony. And, and again, you know, it, it wouldn't be a Letterman show if we didn't have irony. You talk about late show and how in late show, 
they got experimental again. Um, and, and part of the experiment would be Dave feigning that pranks were happening. People would unexpectedly show up, you know, Lyle the intern or whoever would show up or Joe Grossman would show up out of nowhere, suddenly be behind him on the set. Um, and, 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 and people would be pranking Dave. Right. And even though he wanted to be in on everything, that's an element that I think I, I really, really liked that part. And, and when, when you wrote about how that became a deal breaker, I was like, Oh, that makes sense how it did because he likes the control stuff. But the premise itself of the of pranking the host was something that lived on all the way to the very end, even when the show was the big show in the end. I think it was, I I, I forgot if I'm making this wrong, but the, one of the benefits of this, of your project and mine is there, there's a lot of people who worked on the show who were incredibly smart about comedy, right? Yeah. Well, I think Steve O'Donnell might have told me this. He's one. And also, if you spend years- How great is Steve O'Donnell, by the way? Incredible. Incredible. Like, he's so great. Like, professionally, yes, but personally, oh my God, one of the greatest humans walking the face of the planet. I I, I adore him so much. I agree completely, but, but on top of that, and you know, honestly, I don't even know the guy personally. Maybe he kills babies in his spare time. But what I do know <laughs> is that as a comedy mind- and as a guy who was inside on Letterman, he's one of the best I talked to, right? Yeah. And um, I think, again, I hope I'm not, it's in my book, so I hope I'm not, it might've been Randy Cohen, but I think it was Steve O'Donnell, who yep. said that um, Letterman is great as a reactor, right? Yes. He's not like a natural comic in generating things, right? He's, which, we, he, what he, where he is, is, is in reaction to something. So the task as a writer or a producer was to find things for him to react to, right? And yeah. the problem is he, in some ways, Steve or whoever said that, I think it was Steve, understood this better than Dave did. Um, yeah. So the prank is great because then he can react to it or if it's a giant light, if it's a giant a doorknob, yep. right? Something to react against. If it's um, Brother Theodore, that's yeah. something great to react against. If it's Andy Kaufman, obviously it's great. Paul Schaefer is an incredible band leader for David Letterman, maybe not as much for a different host, but yep. perfect because he's a spectacular thing to react against. Yep. And um, at its best, the Letterman shows found put him in places where he could um, bounce off of, you know, where he could be a straight man. I mean, I think maybe the best example is Chris Elliott. Oh, yeah. Where you needed, the reason Chris Elliott was so valuable is one, Letterman kind of liked him and trusted him. Yeah. So he, got, he, he, again, he was able to do ambitious stuff that writers weren't, right? Some yeah, because he wasn't afraid to come at Dave. He wasn't afraid to come at Dave. He also had the pedigree, obviously, because of his dad, who Dave yeah. had incredible respect for and grew up, you know, listening to with his dad. Yeah. Um, and so at a very young age, Chris Elliott was talking Letterman into doing these big concept shows, custom made shows that I don't think anybody else could have done. And yeah. once they were successful at one Emmys, et cetera, they did more of them until they stopped. Right. Yeah. But, um, but what he also did was like the guy under the stairs and the um, conspiracy guy, whatever the other, all the other guys, which were essentially these crazy characters, yeah. which then you could cut to Letterman and have him do a fantastic response to. And the timing was just fantastic. Well, and and uh, Don's giving me a couple of things here. Uh, even later on, though, Alan Coulter with the celebrity interviews, you know, uh, encouraged to be more insulting towards Dave, um, you know, talking about reactive with, uh, you know, Rob Burnett. Um, Mr. Curious, Dave forces Hal out of the other van <laughs> and then Hal picked up a dead rat. Like, like all of these, I, I just, oh my gosh, I could talk about this stuff all day with you. Um, Late Show did try and keep some of these things i think about like the 4 a.m show um you know during hurricane i think it was hurricane sandy okay let's do an let's do some shows without any audience um yes. you know which was every bit as creative as it was convenient uh to do that you know i, I can imagine that idea would be embraced and how see so for me late show and this is where i got to go back to one of your previous uh statements saying that there's more book sitting somewhere. Um, yep. Holy cow. Would it be cool to read uh, the Jason Zinneman magnifying glass over late show? Cause to me, the late show was my tonight show that my dad would say was his tonight show 
the, huh. to me, it's the, like uh, I use this example on here, probably far too much. If you look at Letterman's work as a pyramid, your book is the bottom parts of the pyramid that the tip doesn't exist if it wasn't for those. And it's so sure. important, but when you're standing in Giza and you're looking, you're looking many times at the top and, and, and seeing things to me, that was, that's my late show. Uh, or my Tonight Show was was the you late show. Started watching what year? What year did you start watching? I, well, I started watching. I would say probably eighty seven, eighty eight was when I would sneak up at night. So I was about there, ten, eleven there, years old. Were there periods when you stopped watching? Those were the times I, I I watched the least because parents finding out and things like that getting me in trouble at the VCR I was okay but I was right. like you I wanted to see it at night because I wanted to be able to either talk about it the next day or whatever I want to be part of it right. um, when then I would say it was pretty much a habit from late shift on like last year of NBC. All the sure. way to the very end. Like I, you know, I talk about how Dave was the guy, like when I went through my divorce, uh, he was the guy that I at least was a constant would be on at night. You know, wow. that was, uh, that was, uh, you know, the, the early two thousands, uh, you know, the highs, the lows of my life. I always had Dave as my constant and that's what Johnny Carson used to be for so many people. Late show was that for me. So I loved late show. Like, yeah. Like I was just as excited to meet Joe Grossman as I was to meet Jerry Mulligan um, mm -hmm. because I just, you know, so late show to me is, is that big. And the idea, I understand why you did what you did in your book. It makes sense. That being said, um, Stephen King released uh, the uncut version of the stand <laughs> that many years later with an extra 400 pages. Uh, is, is, is there, is there a way that that material with your magnifying glass on late show is there any way that uh, that could be accessed? Is there a is there a possible. is there a white paper it's, that you can throw out there on a Substack <laughs> somewhere or whatever they call it these days? It's possible. It's possible. I go back to it. It's possible. I go back to it. I mean, the the, uh, the um, I'm not entirely ruling it out, but uh, but I think I think probably not. But yeah. I, th I think probably not. I mean, I think it's better probably to pass it off like to people like you and who uh, you know. It's particularly if like that was the meaningful part. Uh, I'm I am as attached to it as I was, and then there's the last six weeks, which is why I love that book so much because I think the last six weeks there is no time in television history that I like more than the last six weeks of the Late Show, the culmination, the magic that was there was yeah, it was tremendous. Like I mean, I have just as much as respect for the early stuff, but I am as attached. And I know that for many folks, I'm in the minority, but there's a whole generation of that minority that's there as well. Yes, no, it's true. There, there are people. The thing is, there is there's all sorts of complicated film. There's people who probably like grade the later period lower because the early period meant more. There's oh yeah. People, there's people who meant who only care about like the 9/11 period. There's the politics of the the sex scandal, which yep. has scrambled a lot of this. Yep. Then there's also, and you'll find this yourself, the the in interior workings of the show is so different and is not as happy. I, I don't think there's any argument about that. Like yep. there's 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 people who were there early on that probably it was stressful and tough, but that's all been forgotten. Like yep. or most that's not true. A lot of it's been forgotten. Yes, um, or forgiven, or 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 glossed. Yeah, it, yeah. because that's what like, the memory likes to do. It likes to go back to the highlights of things and the nostalgia of things. That's not true of the of the last ten years, last fifteen right. years. That and that the real story and some of that's in my. I mean, if anything, maybe that's the most of my. I wrote before because it's actually fascinating. Like the 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 environment of that show is very eccentric, even by yeah. standards of late night. Um, it's weird um and um, and <laughs> this is so something okay i want to be very cognizant of your time we got six minutes left till you're till you got to be out of here so um part two maybe we can do a part two some point a point and, and and talk about some of this stuff and also if you have any uh any 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 old manuscripts laying around that uh, you need another set of eyes to look at i would be happy to uh volunteer those services to to do that um i think don, it's really important only if don can tell me what i got wrong that's the uh, <laughs> um gosh he uh don just oh here we go there we are <laughs> yes okay thank you don perfect yes 
obviously you could jump on Amazon and get this book right now. Is that the best way? Are you at the point now where you don't want to do any more direct sales? I have a, I have a, my wife and I wrote a book ourselves. So we understand there's the Amazon, but then there's also the part where it's, well, it might be better for to buy it directly, that kind of a thing. At this point here, are you just directing people who want to buy uh, Letterman, the last giant of late night on Amazon, or is there other ways to buy it? Are there ways to get signed versions? And this is where we talk about getting, let's, let's get the book. No, no, up here. I don't, I don't care. I get it anyway. I would say if you can get it, not on Amazon, on, that's better just because Amazon go to your local bookstore not enough money yeah exactly go to look although they don't yeah. have it probably anymore that's the uh so you go to barn i don't know go to barnes and noble maybe which is a slightly less um but whatever get it any way you can i, I don't i'm past that stage of uh yeah. of, of, of of selling the book and um i'm tickled if anyone's interested at all so you know we, you could check out the library even and that'll be fine Okay, uh, but can we hook Mikey up here with a signed copy to go in the of course, yeah, give you the set? We can yeah. figure that out. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Jason, I appreciate you so much. As we kind of close this episode up, uh, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to say thank you to you and, and and outro it and talk about Rupert G. The uh, the and, and the Hello Deli, who is the only sponsor of the Letterman Podcast at this point. They are our sponsor. Go to hello delicom uh, if you want any late show. The only place, by the way, you can get official late show with David Letterman merchandise is still. Rupert G and the hello deli.com. You ever eat at the hello deli, Jace? I have not. I should. I didn't realize any of that. Yeah. Pop in and say hi. Uh, Rupert and May will, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll make you a Paul Schaefer and uh, give you a big smile at the same time. Yeah. No, it, that, again, part of Dave's thing is his generosity. Um, and, and when they left and stopped uh, production of the late show, he said to Rupert, no, you can still have this. You can still do this officially and have the and very, Lots of lots of tales of Dave's generosity in the background uh, that he, again, doesn't take any credit for. Um, is there anything that you want to kind of finish up this conversation with? I really appreciate it. Obviously, it's been a great thrill for me. Uh, seeing it come back out of you has been has been delightful as well as an audience. Um, so thank you very, very much for talking about this. Is there anything that you want to close this thing off with? Um, part one of, of our very first episode here. Um, I would just, I would say Google, uh, just bulbs and watch just bulbs. Cause there's you, your day is always going to be better after watching just bulbs. Absolutely. We, uh, my wife and I were, uh, in New York not too long ago and uh, in the fall and driving out towards the airport on the way out, we passed it. And I was like, Oh, this is great. I, that makes me so happy. I really tried. I asked my, for father's day, uh, my, my kid was, my kids were like, what do you want? And I was like, is there a if there's a just bulbs t-shirt then but it turns out there's not i mean if they sold a t-shirt i could i can't be the only person to get a just bulb t-shirt right i'd do it right i'd do right? it in a second i'd wear it to every concert i go to I, absolutely that's a perfect uh, yeah absolutely that's that fandom that we talk about that's the that the 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 true letterman fan loves that kind of stuff and gets that reference and and it's like when i wear my pants jacket i'm in a small city in in in, in western canada but what if i'm walking down the street and i'm wearing a pants jacket and somebody sees it and knows what it is the immediate bond is such a cool thing and again uh i talked to barbara Gaines during that same trip and 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 and, and uh you know i just happened to see her at rupert's and and she said to me she goes we're all just crazy you know we're all just the right kind of crazy, a bunch of the right kind of crazy people brought together and they work together. Um, I feel the same way about people who are enthusiasts of the show and people who write about the show. So Jason, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Uh, go get your kids. Thank you for doing what you do. We didn't even oh. get into the stand-up stuff. God, we could do an entire thing about uh, the stand-up stuff. Thank you for everything you do. And thank you for keeping that, uh, that reporter mentality um, whose soul um, you know, real job is to incite discussion about things. Thank you for doing that for stand up. Thank you certainly for doing it with Letterman, and just thank you for for everything that you're doing, Jason. Uh, oh, if you want to find Jason, uh, what's uh, let's 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 do let's finish off by saying if you want to find you, people want to find you. What's the best way to follow you? Are you a Twitter guy, Facebook, Instagram? What are you? You can get me on Twitter at, at Zeneman at uh, Instagram, which I'm spending more time on at, um, at uh, Zeneman J at Zeneman J, I believe. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, um, and uh, and you can find me at the at the Times, uh, you know, every, every, you know, once a week or once, around that amount, amount of time. Um, but it's been, let me say, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you, and I'm rooting for you in this podcast. Uh, uh, keep up the good work.
Thank you so much, Jason. Until the next time, thank you so much. Have a fantastic day. Say hi to the kids for us. I will. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, man. Peace and love. Okay. They go by so quickly. Um, that one worked out actually really, really well. He just kind of took off here and I'm staying on the same shot, which I love to do. I love, okay. I'll tell you what, I don't like to edit these things. And the reason why is because I'm lazy. No, it's not. No, no, that's not why it's because I actually, um, when I watch something, I'm the guy that watches the extended movie. I, I like the director's cut. And I, I don't like it when things get cut out of things because I'm always, I'm the type of person that is always wondering, oh, what got cut out there? What, you know, and, and so I don't like to cut things out of here. So when I can do things seamlessly, it's really, really good. Before we finish off, Don, uh, anything you want to say before we, before we uh, say goodbye here? Don's gone off to make a sandwich. Uh, he might, oh, no, never mind. He's here right now. <laughs> Damn right. Damn right. That was a lot of fun. Oh, we don't have you here. We Oh, there he's gone. Okay. Um, and by the way, just, uh, you know, not telling tales out of school, but uh, before we hit the record button and Jason saw Don, the heaps of praise that he leapt upon him uh, were, were, were insane. And Don's going to hate me for saying that because he, just like Dave, doesn't enjoy being praised. But at the end of the day, that book, one of the reasons why it is so good is because Don actually did help fact check it. And, and, and again, um, you know, we're just so appreciative to that. Uh, but Jason's a hell of a guy. I thank you so much for everybody who is uh, embracing this show already. Uh, really, really appreciate it a lot. Got a lot of cool guests coming up here. Um, I guess I'm going to do an outro here. <laughs> um, that has been another episode of the Letterman podcast with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, I am Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants. <laughs>